A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their influences, including writers, musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists, and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, John Acomfra, one of the great filmmakers of the last few decades. From his early years with the Black Audio Film Collective to his recent works as a solo artist, John has consistently explored major issues including climate change, racial injustice, colonialist legacies, diasporic identities and migration through a distinctive approach to memory and history. First shown on television and in the cinema, his films are increasingly made for museums and galleries in the form of ambitious, often epic, multi-screen video installations. John was born in Accra, Ghana in 1957, where his family were connected to the pan-Africanist independence government of Kwame Nkrumah. He came with his family to the UK as a child, eventually going on to study sociology at Portsmouth Polytechnic in southern England. From there, he founded the Black Audio Film Collective, along with seven other students. They quickly came to the fore among other artists addressing the black experience in Britain, including the Sankofa Film Collective, which included a former guest on this podcast, Isaac Julian. Among the many important films made by Black Audio was 1986's Handsworth Songs, a film essay made in response to civil disorder in the district of Handsworth in Birmingham, UK and in London. A conference film explored the roots of the disturbances in the long-term suppression of black people in British society. It did so through a mixture of original footage and imagery from archives and newsreels with an extraordinary collaged soundtrack. It was one of a number of groundbreaking films commissioned by the then new and radical television station in the UK, Channel 4. Among the others that took a similarly experimental approach to the documentary form was Black Audio's Last Angel of History from 1995, which explored Afrofuturism and particularly the links between science fiction and contemporary music. After Black Audio dissolved, a compra founded Smoking Dogs Films with two of its producers, Lena Gopal and David Lawson, and this collaborative trio is the cornerstone of John's films today. They also continue to collaborate with Trevor Matheson, the sound artist who provided Black Audio's films with such a unique sonic identity. After several years of documentary making, particularly about political and music-based subjects, John's practice shifted around 2010 with two related poetic films, Nine Muses for Cinema and Nemosyne, a video installation, both of which used archival material and literary quotation to retell the experiences of post-war immigrants to Britain. In the years since, John has developed this strand into what I think is one of the most significant bodies of work in art so far this century, using multiple screens to create extraordinary cinematic environments, shot through with searing socio-political critique and profound feeling that mine that fusion of archive and original material to spellbinding effect. Among them are the three-screen installation The Unfinished Conversation from 2012, a poignant portrait of the late cultural theorist Stuart Hall, and Triptych from 2020, which which picks up the structure of a famous musical piece by the jazz musician Max Roach in a visceral response to the police killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. But arguably, the defining pieces of John's past decades are three films that form a trilogy exploring, among other things, migration and the environmental crisis. The three-screen film Vertigo Sea from 2015, the six-screen piece Purple from 2017, and Four Nocturnes, another three-screen work from 2019. Typically for John, the experiences of people in the African diaspora are at the heart of this series, so he explores contemporary emergencies amid histories of colonialism. John's theme is not just climate change, change but climate justice and the struggles of refugees today are related to the long history of slavery and empire. John makes them so compelling and distinctive by illuminating his weighty themes through different forms of memory, the personal and collective, and even his own autobiography. He said that Purple was informed in part by growing up in the pollution of Battersea Power Station in South London, and it's this with which I began our conversation. Does there always need to be a kernel of his own story in his work, even when he approaches the biggest global issues? It's, in a way, the best way to come to my practice, 
because what feels quote unquote political, what feels distanced, is in fact routed through you know large chapters, chunks of biography, autobiography. You know, for instance, much of the interest in memory in political becoming chimes really with my own life because I came from a family of political activists who became ministers and governments who were then overthrown and then killed or left countries. And so my interest in the political isn't simply to do with something out there, you know, separate from my life. It's, it's to do with how I've seen and registered the differences, the impact, if you will, that the political makes. I wanted to ask then about a particular project, Purple, which is coming to the Herschel Museum. And I was really struck by the autobiographical element of that was that you grew up, if you like, under the shadow of the Battersea Power Station, which is this grand building in, in London, which is such a sort of prominent feature on the Thames and so on. That was a way into that story about pollution and the effect on the environment, right? Yes. I mean, most of the time, all of the projects start off initially as big ideas, you know, 1492, <laughs> global warming, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, what gives me access to them is to just work out how they resonate, how they chime with my, my own life. So that, for instance, with Purple, two things happened in my childhood which played a part in, in the form that Purple took. You know. One was that in the late 60s, early 70s, that whole area of West London was still covered with craters from the Second World War. So you can play around this area, possibly in bombs that were about to be detonated. Now, it took me a while to work out that the reason the area looked like that was because they were trying to bomb the second thing that was also important, which is the power station, right? So that's why the whole of Chelsea was pockmarked with these bomb craters. And once you realise that, you think, well, what else was this power station for? And of course, you know, it was to burn coal. So what that meant, looking back, was that throughout my childhood, there was this thing called a power station, which basically poisoned everybody of my age in the area. Now, at the same time as it's poisoning us, we are also doing some very socially unacceptable things, like being hooligans, etc., etc. No one ever thought about bringing the two together. No one ever thought to think, well, actually, if you've got an area where kids are brain damaged, <laughs> is it a surprise <laughs> that they're also then hooligans? So I'm interested in the ways in which unseen guests arrive at parties and become actually quite prominent party members, you know, become central actors, if you will, in the ongoing proceedings. So that's why Purple took the form that it did, because I realised that, ooh, this power station was a major unseen guest in my life and in the life of my generation, you know, essentially. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about authorship because it's, it seems to me that there's this really interesting thing that happens in your career, which is, of course, you're part of a collective. And now you are the artist who works still alongside some of the people involved in that collective as a sort of singular authorial voice. But of course, just being here in the studio, I realise how deeply collaborative it remains. Can you say something about that? Is, is there a shift or is it just a, is, is it nomenclature? No, no, it's, it's a, on one level, there's been an absolute rapture, which there had to be because the nature of the collective practice that underpinned Black Audio's activity involved subsidies from, you know, foundations, local councils, you know. I mean, there were seven, eight people who were working in a space making stuff and they all needed to be fed and paid and, you know, all of that. And at some point, I think all collectives kind of have their sell-by date because you set out with a project, you know. We want to make, for instance, black representation a legitimate part of everyday discourse well at some point it happens it does become that and so at that point you think well what do we do do we carry on still pretending that things haven't changed or do you do you change you know I think there's also a kind of narrative arc to collectives because at some point the question of time itself starts to play 
a big part in the drama. You know, people get older, their interests change, you know, and so on. So there were incredible raptures, but incredible continuities as well, because there's still one or two of you who, you know, might not want to work in exactly the same way as you did before, but still want to collaborate, you know. So that's what's going on in a sense that, you know, there were eight of us, and we became seven for most of the 80s and 90s. And out of the seven, I still work with another three. So the majority of members of Black Audio are still involved in what I do now. But the change had to come, not just because we, we wanted it, but also time does things with you, you know. It plays very interesting tricks with you. <laughs> Indeed. One of the journeys that you've been on over the time, beginning with Black Audio, but now in your solo work, is a constant dialogue, it seems to me, between fiction and collage or new material that you're shooting and found material. And I'm interested in that mix and how instinctive the combination is and how very much programmed it is. I want to go further in this direction on this one. This needs to be a film that has more, you know, original material. This needs to be more archival. Can you say something about that? Yeah, I mean, we could be here all day. (laughs) If I, if I try to say what I really feel about it. But, I mean, in Precy, I think two, three things inform this endless shifting between narrative horizons, if you will. One is that the line, the demarcation between what constitutes fiction and documentary, in the case of minority identities, is itself a fiction. Because the signifier slides between the two. You know, in large part, what most people think about a person of color is fiction, stereotype, if you will. So you have to foray, you have to make journeys into the fictional in order to decode, uncover, deconstruct the non fictional. That was always clear. You know, one of the seminal things that happened to me as a child was photographing the 81 riots. I realized that what I witnessed and what was reported the next day were completely at odds, you know. And in this strange way, before I understood theoretically unconscious bias, I saw it at work. You saw that actually in the encounter with the real, the things people call on to make sense of it are usually from the realms of fiction. You know, black kids are criminals, so they will be the ones who say, kill, 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 not scared police officers. Even though that's what you're seeing, that's not what's reported. And it's not that people are trying to be malevolent or evil or anything, but there is a really complex way in which we live in spaces of fiction, in our so-called realities. And it's important to, to acknowledge that. So that's one of the main reasons why... I have so little respect for that demarcation. (laughs) Um, It's not to say that I don't respect journalism or the veracity of of documentary truth, but I think usually the ways in which people construct that line is overly mechanical, and it's itself, as I said, a fiction, you know? Yeah. Does that that answer? It does, yeah. And one of the interesting things to me is the way that you use certain narrative devices or you use certain constructs in order to to kind of set a framework for the way that you explore along that line so I was really interested in you know just looking through your career and seeing like you know there there are things like there are seven songs for Malcolm X then you have nine muses then you have four nocturnes so you have frameworks and constructs which you allow all of these things to come together in right yes I mean I think it's important with all the work to have boundaries, because without boundaries, nothing really works, you know. So the the tyranny of formlessness has to be fought constantly with a kind of resolution to develop lines of demarcation that, you know, you know are temporary, and, and they're themselves fictions, you know. Nevertheless, that then allows you the space in which you can, for the duration of that project, explore the questions at hand, you know. So uh, Four Nocturnes, for instance, you know, I mean, I was interested in the ways in which if you said you wanted to do a project on using the very, very old 
ways in which we we use to describe our planet you know uh, along the, the lines of the four elements what if you could turn fire air water into songs what sort of song would they be and what if you said all the the four elements would be just night songs you know nocturnes a la Debussy or any other classical composer what if you said that was what you wanted to do what if you said those were the rules you wanted to use to look at contemporary climate change and and the ways in which it's impacting on parts of the world that are not normally considered talked about in in climate change terms what would happen it is a fiction it's a construct for sure but it does mean that that I would set myself the challenge of doing four chapters that's it if there are five one has to go <laughs> either is dispensed with or we find a way of integrating it with some of the others and just that that attempt to stick to that discipline becomes the animating feature of the project. And what about the form that the work eventually takes? Because that seems to me to be a really interesting thing. Obviously, the majority of your work now appears in museum gallery yes. spaces. Yes. But still, there is work that appears as more conventional kinds of film, right? Yes. But can you start out on a production saying, this could go in any direction, or do you need the narrow focus of, we're making this for television or, or cinema yeah. as opposed to gallery? Yeah, yeah well, that's an interesting question, actually. And television, less and less, because actually the, the reasons why we went into it in the first place, the conditions of existence have changed so dramatically that, you know, you know, I got into television because of Channel 4. And we did so because at the time there was this Brechtian conviction that we needed to move into the centre in order to make common sense our ideals, political, aesthetic, narrative ideals. I mean, at that moment's gone, you know, um, and it went a long time ago. So I'm certainly not under any illusion that... that TV can be turned into, <laughs> into the commons. Nevertheless, I thought those experiments and those interventions were absolutely critical, you know. And there are things that we learned, ways of doing things that are still valuable, but I'm not chasing that space any longer. It happens occasionally, and when it does, we rise to it. I, I mean, essentially, what you have to decide with each piece is whether the ambitions for it matches the budgetary constraints which are necessary all the time and the space of transmission slash exhibition slash installation you know what we're doing now we've had to decide very early on whether it's a gallery piece or a cinema piece i don't think it is a cinema piece but i do think it has post cinematic ramifications, implications, which will inform it, you know. So increasingly, put it this way, I would say that the post-cinematic considerations are what lead us, if you will, almost leash-like into where we're going. Let's move on to the questions we ask all our guests. Right. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? You know, I was going to the Tate really since I was very young. So I'd pretty much seen most of what would be in the Tate collection by the time I was 18, 19. You know. And I loved most of it, especially the British stuff. Well, in fact, that was all you had then. But actually, the work that I fell in love with wasn't in a gallery at all. It was an album cover. Jackson Pollock's White Light from 1954 was the inner sleeve of a 1960 album by Ornette Coleman called Free Jazz. And I bought it secondhand, Hammersmith, probably 74.5, went home. I bought it because of the album. It said Free Jazz. I thought, well, oh, you know. And when you opened it, it's a double sleeve, there in the middle of it was this painting. It was the first abstract expressionist piece I ever saw, and it was a knockout. I mean, you know, because of the music. Did you sit and, like, literally open the gatefold sleeve and sit there listening to the music, looking at the image? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I've literally only had two albums. 
or two records that did that. New Order's Blue Monday was the same kind of, you looked and you thought, wow, it's a floppy disk. <laughs> I remember Trevor Matheson and I bought it. The first day it came out, we put it and we played it all day because we just couldn't get our heads around the idea <laughs> that it was designed as a floppy disk. You're like, whoa. And, and uh, Free Jazz did the same, you know, because there was this, it was a genius pairing, you know. This was Orna Coleman playing with his sort of then key group, you know, quartet, and a new quartet, which also had members in it that had played with him before, but not necessarily all together. So it was completely improvised, two quartets responding to each other, and the flights, you know, the shifts of light and shade, absolutely mirrored what was going on in the Pollock. I mean, it was the best art history lesson I ever got. And I never forgot that, you know. I mean, you know, like in the end, once you found out about, you know, CIA and Peter Fuller's thesis about, yeah, yeah I get it, you know. It may well be that, that abstract expressionism was a kind of American foreign policy import. Fine, I get it. But as an 18-year-old, when you first saw that album and that painting, it, it was a knockout. And, and I, I still remember that. And which historical artist do you turn to the most today? Yeah, I mean, the signposts, I call them, the, the sirens change project by project. But Turner remains a constant. Uh, and do you remember seeing him at the tape in your youth? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, because there was so much of it. <laughs> <laughs> there was so much Turner, you just couldn't avoid it. And I didn't always get it. The sheer volume somehow stopped you from seeing the revolutionary significance of it, you know. And not all of it is necessarily interesting, you know. But the drama ones, the, the, what I call, the, you know, Turner's cinematic ones, are incredible, you know, the, the ones where you just feel as if he has placed you in some incredible vantage point to spectate on real drama, you know, shipwrecks, storms, the coming of the day. Now, you know, all of this was, I kind of just imbibed and took on. But yeah, I returned to him probably more than anyone else. And he's so present in Vertigo C, of course. Yeah. Yeah, in a way, all the people I'm going to mention are people I have a kind of dialogue with, you know. So it's not just a respect, it's also about a wonder, you know, a walk. I'm going on a walk with these figures. And the rhythm of the walk, the, the tenor and tone of their voice in, a, in that conversation matters because that's, that's really what I'm looking for. So it's not like a direct influence in the sense that I, they don't say anything or show me something and I go, okay, I'm going to put this in the work. But, you know, in that conversation, you know, suddenly sparks fly and you go, oh, okay, yeah, I can mm. use that. <laughs> you know? So I want people to feel the presence, the ghostly presence of these figures without necessarily quoting them directly, if that makes sense. Yeah, so you're not going to be making the film with an image of a Turner painting right next to you sort of thing. No, but even when we do, it's weirdly enough for the painting to look at what we're doing <laughs> and tell me whether it's any good or not. <laughs> because you also have this way of measuring the efficacy of practice by a conversation with the silent guest. You know, you look at a, an image on the wall next to you in your edit, you know, for instance, that Navajo man, it's a, a portrait taken sometime in the 1880s, and he's staring directly at you and saying something. And occasionally, I just have to imagine that this piece that I've just put together, which involves him, either meets with his approval, indifference, something. It doesn't matter, but as long as there's, a, there's something. An acknowledgement of his presence, in a way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and usually when you do that thing of looking at what you've just done and the figure spectating, you can tell. It's almost like um, a private language beyond the, the realms of the everyday that just tells you, you know. It's the presence of the numinous, if you like. It's the presence of spirit, you know, a, a kind of bond between you and that image. Which contemporary artist do you most admire? Wow. 
for the list. <laughs> <laughs> a few, but on the basis of this dialogue that I'm talking about, Julie Mireille too, because I find the, the mathematical brain a complete mystery. <laughs> she draws webs that you become entangled in, right? <laughs> Julie does entanglement <laughs> really well. And, and there's a way in which that fits where we are at the moment. Tacita Dean, because, you know, because Tacita is Tacita. <laughs> and we walk in the same fields, not necessarily picking the same flowers, but <laughs> in the same fields, if you like. So her work is always a source of incredible pride and admiration for me. Arthur Jaffa, because AJ is one of those figures without whom I wouldn't be on this journey, if you like, you know, because we met when we were both very young. We spoke in detail about what it was that the black body needed. This is in the 80s. We worked on projects together. That's right. He was cinematographer for the seven songs for Malcolm X, That's right? right, yeah. And cinematographer in those days was a real rites of passage because we spent a lot of time before and after the shoot planning things, experimenting with things to arrive at what you've got there now. So, yeah, a true friend and an incredible influence as well. Rene Green... Kerry James Marshall, Zanelli Moholy, and Trevor Matheson. Mm. You know, Trevor's, he's like this artist I've always wanted to be. <laughs> and we'll probably never quite get there in the sense that, that Trevor has and always has had projects, but he's prepared to forego in order to embark on collaborative journeys with you, you know. And I'm so happy that some of them are being realized now. You know, he kind of put aside a lot after an MA in, in sculpture at Chelsea <laughs> to, be, to be a member of the collective. You know, so I've always admired his example, right. you know, his way of, of being. Yeah. Kerry's always there because I've always got something of his on the wall. Because the interrogations of blackness, it's undoing, it's becomings, you know, it's um, encounters with with the disaster, the tragic, and so on, uh, which are a hallmark of his. Works in pretty much the same way that we've been doing, except that he's, he's, you know, he's a fricative painter. You know, mm. he's, that's, that's his thing. Whatever the subject in Kerry's work, there's always that sense of space for the marvellous, if you know what I mean, yeah. the, the, all the fantastical within, within sometimes incredibly hard-hitting subjects. You know, the, in the end, Kerry made sense when I understood that he was a history painter. <laughs> You suddenly think, okay, that's what's going on here. There are these collisions of time, you know, because there he is, you know, in the eyes, usually of the figure in question. You can see him there, but he's in 1955 or, or sometimes in the future. But the question that this is an interrogation of a historical temporal shift is always there. You know, you, you can tell that there, there's a moment that he's looked at which is what's been, quote-unquote, reproduced. There's a primal scene which lies elsewhere that's being evoked in what you're looking at. And I, I love that. At this point, I normally ask what you have on your studio wall. We're sitting in your studio, and you've already alluded to one thing in this studio. You talked about how your sort of historic references shift with mm. each. Does, like, an image bank come with those historical references? Yes, like? always. In fact, each project comes with a, a shift. There's one that's kind of stayed for a while because it really was an image from two projects back. But I can't quite let go of it because of what it says. And it leans against the white shelf. So I, I come out of my little unit into the Warren as a studio. <laughs> and, and I see it both going in and out. It's a photograph taken in the Congo in the 1880s. There's a dead elephant, and surrounding the, the dead elephant are all these Africans, with the exception of one figure who's right at the top, who's, who's white, essentially. And... It's an extraordinary image because it is meant to tell you something about blackness, but actually tells you everything you need to know about whiteness and its becoming, right? Because both the dead elephant and the Africans are there to reenact a scenario. And the scenario is one of black uncivility, 
But in order for that to be staged, you need the prop, props rather, plural, of the dead elephant and the not-so-alive Africans to be in it, you know, so that they can speak their barbarism or their savagery or, you know, and you can bet they didn't shoot that elephant. But that's what you're meant to infer from the image, that they have killed that magnificent beast. And so I'm always looking at that image because in it is a kind of infinite rehearsal, as Wilson Harris used to say. <laughs> it's a kind of infinite rehearsal of becoming and how becomings chime with power, how power likes to present itself. You know, it's a very good example of that for me. That image reminds me very strongly and may indeed have been used in Four Nocturnes. Is, is that right? Yes, yes. Because the whole idea behind Four Nocturnes was to construct this kind of multi-species narrative in which the, the historicity of an African scene evokes the lives and afterlives of both human and non-human species. <laughs> you know, like it seems, it seems a really stupid thing to say, but, you know, every time someone mentions global warming, you sort of need to realize <laughs> that the spaces in which it happens affects not just human beings. You know, there's no water. A lot of other species hit the dust. And it's part of the kind of narcissism of our project on, on global warming and, and climate change that we continue to speak in those terms, you know, about it. So it felt to me as if in order to evoke the history of unbecoming in, in Africa, one needed to, to talk about other histories. And, you know, to be honest, it's not that difficult, you know, because I was in a, a museum on Central Africa in, in Belgium researching that project. And in their photographic library, looking at images of the colonial project in the 19th century, particularly in Africa. And I was amazed at how many ways, how many images in that collection were about putting Africans, quote unquote, and non-Africans, usually animals, together. Dead, alive, heads cut off, not cut off. You know, and some were so grotesque in their pairing, it helped to see a compulsion at work. And so at that point, I'm like, okay, what is this compulsion? What is this desire to chop off an animal's head, put it next to an African, get him to stand next to it, lean on it, lie on it? What's the compulsion to kill a rhino and then have a whole bunch of people lying on it? You think, oh, okay. Because in the act of undoing their legitimacy, their ability to be you're by implication speaking up for something else, right? It felt like in the space of colonial becoming, two things happen at the same time, a kind of double movement. You have to show that some things are not worth having alive and some things are. And the way in which you do that is to bring them together, your gaze and them. <laughs> <laughs> together, if that makes sense. Absolutely, it does. And it actually leads very interestingly on to my next question, which is about museums and right. which museum you visit most frequently. Oh, well, I mean, that, that hasn't changed, I have to say. You know, I grew up very, very close to the Tate. It used to take me, even as a 10 year old, about 30 minutes to walk to it. And I still do that. I mean, I don't live in West London anymore, but I still go to the Tate quite a bit. You know, I think other than the Listen Gallery, it's probably the the gallery I most visit. There are galleries that I want to have more, or museums I want to have more relationships with. You know, the National Portrait and and the National Gallery are two. But for some reason, I just don't get there enough. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't. In terms of that project you were just talking about, like analysing museum archives, seeing colonialism writ large embedded in so many museums is in a way your approach to museums quite often project driven on the one hand and therefore also that kind of archival and actually sort of embedded in that whole decolonization process yeah i mean you know like museums have a, a really kind of interesting space in in my life and i suspect the lives of many people like me you know in the sense that we've had to adapt our perceptions of them as we've sort of got to know them in a way you know uh, on the one hand you, you got taken to them very young and so they were sort of 
chapels of taste, formation and inheritance, you know, and you got that very young. But at some point, you also start to realize that the very things that they encourage you to believe are the things denied you, that in a way they both open and close doors of perception, of access, etc., etc. And so my trajectory now through them involves that double move to acknowledge their value, which, you know, is undoubted and um, beyond dispute, it seems to me, but to also then say that there needs to be doors of perception inside these places that take you elsewhere because they are also closing those doors. There, there are collections of material in these places that do not belong there. They, I mean, quite literally, Benin bronzes and Elgin marbles and, you know, I mean, the museums built on, you know, like millions of looted material <laughs> that don't belong there. Now, was it good that they were there for people who saw them? Of course. So they did perform that duty of imparting taste and judgment and so on. But they also then closed those doors for people to realize that actually, you know, other parts of the world, for instance, have been denied access to the material. And in some cases, it's a criminal neglect because it belongs to those parts of the world, you know. So it's a double move now that I think we need to make. We need to kind of see both what museums and galleries offer, but also what they're withholding. And they need to be challenged on both, you know, to improve what they offer, but to also improve... <laughs> on what they're withholding, if that makes sense. I mean, I am a friend. I'm a friend of the museum. I'm not an enemy. I, I'm, I don't want to burn anything down. I don't want barricades. You know, I'm a friend. But that friendly conversation needs to be on this basis. You know, the, the dual function has to be in place. It can't be the old way anymore. Oh, we're custodians of taste. You just let us do it and we'll do it. And that, no, it's not going to work anymore, I don't think. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 100 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. If you download Bloomberg Connects, you'll find guides to many of the galleries in which John O'Comfra has shown his work, from the Hayward and Serpentine Galleries in London to the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles and the ICA in Boston. The digital guide to the ICA tells you everything you need to know about the museum through video, audio and text, including information on its current exhibition exhibitions and on Dillus Scofidio and Renfro's remarkable waterfront building design. It also has a discrete section on Simone Lee's presentation in the American Pavilion at this year's Venice Biennale, which the ICA commissioned. Elsewhere on the app, you can find a comprehensive guide to the Biennale itself. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? I've sort of alluded to it, actually. But, I mean, there were two things. They happened like six months of each other. Uh, one was having just been given a, a camera, taking it on the streets of Brixton to, to film the disturbances of 81, you know, the, the urban riots, if you will, of 81. And, and noticing after the fact the slippage between appearance and reality or what I thought was happening and what was reported and so on. I mean, that was a major cultural shift in my head because I suddenly realised that the importance of something that we will get to know a couple of years later as the, the politics of representation, if you like. I think almost six, seven months after that was the Black Art Conference, the first Black Art Conference in Wolverhampton called by students there at the time, Claudette Johnson, uh, Marlene Smith, Keith Piper, and Donald Rodney, now, of course, and Eddie Chambers. And they, they put out this call to all the other colleges across the country for black artists to come together. And so the nucleus of Black Audio then went to that conference, and it was a life changer. It was, it was just, you know, I mean, to see a room filled with, I think, about maybe 100 people, all of whom were either 
trying to be black artists, were black artists, wanting to be black artists. It was just like, whoa. <laughs> it's really interesting because one of the things I perceive about that period is, on the one hand, fantastic mm. activity among the artists, but also an imbalance when it came to institutional recognition. There was some institutional recognition, but for instance, there weren't the big surveys at the major museums that there perhaps should have been in that time. We're getting those now, you know, ironically, but actually in that moment, it seems to me there was an imbalance in terms of where the work was shown and, and the kind of curatorial kind of acknowledgement of it. Yes, and I, I tell you, the thing which was sort of slightly interesting was the ways in which the normal tenure of being an artist were kind of foreshortened by that process. <laughs> so, I mean, we were there and we'd, we're just about trying to figure out what this means. My thing was that we should never call ourselves artists because it's, uh, I mean, it's a problem. What we needed to do was to work out what our practice was going to be and then leave the naming of it to another time. And so that was one argument we had. Now, I'm having this argument with Rashid Arin and Frank Bolin. They shouldn't be there. Neither Rashid or, or Frank, who were then like <laughs> mid-career artists, you know, should have been there. But that hadn't happened. So you get this incredible foreshortening where, you know, the perspective, the quattrocento perspective disappears. It, it all becomes like an early... Medieval paintings, all flat, you know, we're all on the same plane, almost, you know. And that created huge problems, you know. The one thing that's happening now is, is that the proper perspective is beginning to happen. You, you've now got a Brunelleschi dome. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the proportions are right, you know, the people who should be at the top and on the side, and, you know, that's kind of happening. Whereas then it was, it felt almost as if the fact that you said you were an artist of colour condemned you to a certain position in time. It's important to understand this. At the time, there was a huge debate about whether you named yourself in racial terms at all. And people say, no, I don't. I'm just an artist. I don't want to be called a black artist. We were very happy to be called black artists. In fact, we wanted to be called black artists. But there are many, many people who were really unhappy with that. They wanted to be artists first and identity. Second. Including people like Frank Bowling himself. He, that, that, he's said that several times. Didn't yes, he, that he, yeah. absolutely. There are people who were just like, okay, the point was, you had to say to them, listen, it is no coincidence <laughs> that we're all here at this conference. No coincidence at all. That you are not, if you don't mind me saying so, not that much further down the road than we are. Right? So, calling yourself an artist or a black artist has made no effing difference not an iota of difference. So let's just relax on that, okay? I'm not going to judge people who say they don't want to be, but equally, please don't, you know, because neither of us are getting what we want here, <laughs> right? It's not like yours was the way and uh, redemption and salvation lay at the end and you could see it and we can't, you know, the, the light was shut off from both of us. Both paths didn't seem to have any redeeming features to them. They weren't leading anywhere. That was the problem. Was, there was no path that seemed to lead to enlightenment or salvation. And then, of course, the other part, you, you know, you're talking there, you are with a video camera filming yeah. the events in 1981. Mm. It's a very good moment then to talk about Handsworth songs, and, and which I guess is still regarded as your sort of early major work. Yes. It, it came actually from lots of other works that were of a similar ilk just before it. But Handsworth song, I mean, what position does it have for you now when you look back on that? I, um, I went to see it ooh, a month ago at the National Film Theatre because Channel 4 were doing their 50th or 40th anniversary and they, they were showing it. So I went to see it. And, you know, I have to say, bits of it still... There's an elegy and a sadness um, that hasn't gone, that I still feel, watching bits of it, you know. And it's strange because, you know, we were kids. <laughs> we were children. And I'm still slightly struck by how we got those insights. And that's the thing that struck me about Handsworth. There's still this enigma, even for me, about where it came from. And I, as I said, don't necessarily feel like we were in complete control of everything. There were things that we knew we wanted to do. That was clear. 
Because Handsworth was born of a defeat, came out of a, a defeat. By the time we'd finished, the quote-unquote riots had long gone. Most people already made up their mind about what it was. It was a, a black looting affair which did no good whatsoever. That was a foregone conclusion. And in a way, all reflective pieces face that task because the journalism and the current affairs and the news get there way before you do. They have more resources to do what they want to do and say what they want to say. So if you're going to do something after the fact, it needs to be something slightly different to what they've said, either in response to them or in opposition to them. But then also you're able to comment, as you did, in that incredibly powerful sequence where you're showing the montage of all the headlines right. from Handsworth with the strains of Jerusalem playing in the background. And that's kind of a seminal moment in the film. Yeah, it was a seminal moment in all kinds of ways. you know. And, and you have to understand that by going to the, the figures involved in that drama. So everything that's in Handsworth, you've had to beg someone for or pay through the nose for. The only person who we didn't have to do that with was Mark Stewart. You know, Mark Stewart was one of the members of the, the post-punk group called the pop group. And he was then beginning to do his solo work together. So that track, Jerusalem, is by Mark Stewart and the Mafia. And we just wrote to him. We said, look, this is what we want to do. We want to use this track. He said, fine. I'm like, oh. <laughs> It was such a shocking <laughs> moment, you know. It, it didn't happen very often. I mean, most of the time people would give you such a kick in. I remember trying to get something from a very, very famous 60s pop group. I wouldn't mention them, but, you know, very big, put it that way. And not the Beatles. <laughs> very big. Should get my drift. <laughs> I, think, I think all our listeners may understand who you're talking about. We got such a kick in for that. And you learn something, you know, like, okay, so you do really basically black music and black folk come and asking you for shit. And you say, okay, fine. You know, you, we learn something. And none of that drama with Mark. Mark was like, yeah, that's music. I mean, we still said, okay, look, we want to pay you. But it didn't matter to him, basically. It's an extraordinary sequence for that reason for me as well. Because when we were putting it together, it was on the basis of knowing that there was no problem. You couldn't say that for most stuff. <laughs> <laughs> most stuff in, the, in Hands of Songs, you didn't know in the end whether you could get away with having it or not, really. Let's talk about literature. Which writers or poets do you return to? Oh, Constance, but also changes. You know, Milton always, because I love Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. I just love Paradise Lost. I think it's like the defining work of English fiction, you know, for me. It's the work that, in which the language feels the most at home, feels the most used, inexhaustible possibilities explored by just the, the opening scene alone, you know. So, yeah, I never get tired of, of reading it, but I also never get tired of listening to Anton Lesser read it for a very famous <laughs> audio book seller. <laughs> <laughs> but you've used Anton, he's, he's the yeah. voice of Nine Muses. Right? Absolutely. I just love Anton Lesser's voice and I, I love Anton Lesser's voice particularly when he reads <laughs> Milton because he just gets it. He just, you know, the, with, with all old English, there's always traps and troughs and, you know, corners you can't turn. And you hear Anton, you go, oh, okay, that's the intonation. That's how I'm supposed to turn that corner. I get it, thank you. You know, Again, Virginia Woolf, the waves, because I don't think anyone in the 20th century got how to put those two things together that obsesses me more than anything, which is the space we live in and how we live in it. <laughs> you know, how light behaves, how time behaves, and how consciousness interacts with those two things. I don't know anyone who's got it better than that, you know. That's that sort of claustrophobic power of the waves, oh, isn't there? God. But at the same time, the light, as you say, that sort of light and the poetry of the yeah. language allows you to escape from it. There's too much claustrophobia. Yeah. But yeah. the claustrophobia is the fact that you're, like, plugged into... <laughs> <laughs> into the back of matrix like into the back of people's heads six people and you're like oh i don't want it this is too close <laughs> can you move me back a little <laughs> bit from this you know and just when you think 
you can't take any more. There's this light, quite literally, light coming in, you know. So, but it depends on what I'm doing, you know. At the moment, Wilson Harris, because I'm spending a lot of time in Latin America on the new project, and Wilson's Guyanese Quartet is useful. For some reason, Afro Canadian poetry is in a really strong place at the moment. I mean, some of the best poetry are by black Canadians, in my view, at the moment. That's really you interesting. Yeah. So rummaging through that a lot, you know. And, I mean, it isn't even worth naming names because there's so many of them, <laughs> you know. I want to ask about Octavia Butler because yes. you made this great film called The Last Angel of History. Mm-hmm. It was about Afrofuturism, right? Yes. But you spoke to Octavia Butler. Yes. And, and one of the things is that I've spoken to lots of people on this podcast who mention her, but you've literally sat down in front of her and, and, and talked to her. So yes. tell me about that. I mean, you know, one of these days I've been meaning to do this, you know, because obviously when you make a film based on interviews with people, you only use a fragment. And I've got, I don't know, an hour and something, maybe more, of Octavia Butler speaking. And so I've, I've been meaning to just get the tapes out and polish it up and put it online, just so that people can hear her speak. What was she like? Well, she was imposing incredibly regal and majestic because she's quite a tall Mm. woman certainly way taller than me and deeply philosophical in her ways of you know know, you'd ask a question and she would kind of ruminate on it and then offer a view very modest I mean both in her manner and bearing as well as surroundings incredibly frugal almost an approach to life if we're talking about writers i think we should talk about Stuart hall such a an important figure for you not just in terms of his writings but in terms of his moral support for you as an artist and your colleagues no Stuart was the figure i suspect all of us want to be <laughs> we probably fail miserably in trying to be that when i think back to the support that he offered throughout actually i mean you know we we had made handsworth we'd just finished editing it and felt that it needed an eye. And of course, you know, he was based at the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, which is in Birmingham. Hansworth is in Birmingham. He had written about young black people and their relations with the state, particularly the police. So we just thought, okay, you know, let's get him to have a look. He had no reason to come. Didn't know us or Adam. Turned out that he did know who we were. <laughs> and came and did something that that I've always tried to kind of emulate, really, which is to come and say, okay, I've got this to tell you. You don't have to do it, but I would be irresponsible to not say this to you. So he came, he told us quite a few things, most of which we didn't listen to, (laughs) (laughs) which then got us into a lot of trouble. But at the end, when the trouble started, that's exactly when he became... This year that you know, he came to the fore. You know, it's no secret. Salman Rushdie, in the 80s, we didn't get on. Well, it's not that we didn't get on. He certainly didn't like Hansworth songs and, and made it plain in a Guardian article, which Stuart then responded to, mm. to say, look, you may have reasons for wanting them to make this kind of film, but you cannot deny it that the effort you're requiring of them is precisely what is in evidence in this film. You know, so relax and let him get on with it you know he did that and he didn't have to you know and he continued to do that which music or other audio do you listen to while you're working changes a lot again i don't know like at the moment post-punk is making a very big you know, reappearance in my life. So I've been listening quite a lot to Young Marble Giants, the Colossal Youth album, which is still like extraordinary, you know. And to the album that I'm not sure ever got his just desserts, really, which is the Rip Rig and Panic album called God. Oh, it's a. <laughs> and again, so everyone there's so young. Sean was Andrew Oliver's uh, brother, who was a bass guitarist, he was dead by the time he was 29, mm. you know. He was doing that in his early, early 20s. It's an extraordinary album. And sometimes what happens is that I I start listening to one thing and I carry them with me for for years. So John Luther Adams' um, Becoming Ocean has been a presence in my life since Vertigo, you know, and 
I don't know, in a way when I can't quite make sense of shit, <laughs> I go to that, you know. It's a sort of threnody and it goes on for 45 minutes and there's no breaks and there's just something about the structure of it, the Wagnerian structure of it absolutely works. It's like, you know, trying to imagine what the post-symphonic form of classical music would sound like. I was really hugely into classical music. I think something's happened. I think we've, we've reached a, a, a moment when the symphonic form, which was the, the quintessential form that classical music took, has had its time. It feels to me as if the durational possibilities that modernity offers us does not include a four-act <laughs> music cycle anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's like a big deal. It's a big deal to, to listen to. I think increasingly he will go the way of, of all flesh. And John Luther Adams feels to me like one of those figures who's just got it, who's understood what's going on, and he's beginning to think about how one addressed it. So did Avril Pert, to be honest. Mm. You know, Avril Pert's music was post-symphonic in that sense. It kind of got the fact that the, the slightly formulaic four-act thing wasn't carrying the kind of musical sonic weight that people expected it to anymore. And you've used Peart's music in your own films, right? All the time. Yeah. Another constant. <laughs> Another constant. In fact, I've used, other than Handsworth, I started with the Testament. So since 88, there wasn't a piece that didn't have a Peart in it. I mean, not one, until very, very recently. That's extraordinary. Yeah. I finally plucked up the courage to write to him <laughs> and was invited to come and uh, see him. I haven't had the time, unfortunately, since, but I, I will go to meet him because the music has been uh, extraordinary for me. I, I, mean, I remember I was the first time I heard it, I was 82, standing in a squat in, in South Sea, overlooking the sea, and a piece came on and I'd never heard anything like it. I subsequently found out it was a track called Cantus to the Memory of Benjamin Britten. And it's just one soaring note held for 15 minutes. It's, it's extraordinary. And each member of the orchestra obeyed that note, started slowly and just built to this crescendo and then just died off. Just stood there, I mean, dumbfounded. I'm like, who the F is this? <laughs> I mean, for me, like music in your work feels so central to that kind of sense of almost epiphany through the work. And I, I had that because I had never heard triptych prayer protest piece yes. before I saw your work, oh, triptych. Okay. So I had this epiphany about that piece of music in front of your work when right. I saw it. But it seemed to me you were using that music so interestingly. Say something about that piece. I mean, I met Max Roach. I interviewed him to do a piece on Louis Armstrong. You know, it was one of those few moments when two things come together in your life, you know, because there's this guy who was there at the dawn of jazz, post-war jazz, bebop. I mean, Max Roach played on, for me, the greatest jazz track of bebop called Coco. It's 1949, and he's 17, 1718, he's there, right? At the beginning of a revolution <laughs> In the sonic, incredible, you know. So yes, I've always had time for him. I've always followed him, and his life takes these interesting forms. So by the time he did the track that we used called "We Insist," all the sort of sinews of radicalism in his work had come to the fore. So the music was an attempt to say something about the burgeoning civil rights movement at the time. It was released in a way that, that was basically his way of saying, we want control of the means of production, you know. It was released on Candid, the album, but, you know, Max had a lot to do with how ways in which and how the profits were shared on Candid and so on. You know, so he'd already got to that point that other musicians would get to way later, which is, you know, we want to own the means of production. And, mm. et cetera, et cetera, you know? and the album is unique because... Very rarely is the voice and a female voice especially allowed that improvisatory role, wordless improvisatory role in 
a great piece of ensemble performance. You know, you can think about the stuff, you know, Billie Holiday and, you know, Ella Fitzgerald did, but, you know, these are standards. They're singing standards and they have to fit whatever improvisatory zeal they've got inside of that. This is not the case. <laughs> it's something completely different. It's like Abby Lincoln being given free reign to do what the hell she wants to do. Mm. And then the band trying to keep up or trying to follow or trying to support in some way. I, I just thought it was an extraordinary album. And at the beginnings of Black Lives Matter, the protest, it just felt like the piece to hear again, <laughs> you know. It had the lyricism, it had the sense of urgency, it had the, the, the sonic innovations, it had the anger, mm. everything. Because what Max was trying to say in that piece was that there is a kind of arc, there's a narrative arc to black protest or black anger, if you will. And the hope is that it fits those three bits that it starts off as a sort of prayer, protest, and then peace. You do get to the point that you want to at the end. Rarely happens, but <laughs> you know, that, that's the hope. And I love that piece because of that, because it says in such a short space of time, this is a narrative arc of black protest. I want to ask you also about the extraordinary coming together in Last Angel of History of this extraordinary history of music. And I wonder if you knew then the influence that Afrofuturism was ultimately going to have in terms of, you know, because it seems to me it was prescient, that film, of where we are, it's kind of now, actually. Yeah. Put it this way, I had an inkling that something was about to happen and that something was that there was going to be a, a sort of re-evaluation of Detroit techno, right? I had an inkling that was going to happen and it felt to me as if the sonic innovations of Detroit techno could be compared to some of the innovations of the Jamaican music of the 70s in particular. No, once, so once you got there, you're like, okay, talking to... Because many of the people in it were friends inside Last Angel. Greg Tate, we'd made films with before, Kojo Eshin, you know, So these are conversations we are having amongst ourselves about how to speak about black on popular music. Not black pop, but black on popular. And, you know, that was the thing that united them. Right. They were not Motown. <laughs> they were not dancing in the street, which is interesting because Motown is from the same town as Techno. Mm. So we had inklings. You know, this is what I was trying to say to you earlier. You know, the, sometimes the, the siren songs and the trick, really the only trick that you need is to just listen and heed as much as you can what the call is saying. There are no rocks. There's no crashing to be done. Just follow the siren songs. And usually it leads somewhere productive. Am I surprised that it happened? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all the way to Black Panther, who would have thought? Very surprised. <laughs> but it was, put it this way, in the air. You know, I, I remember kind of speaking to Greg a couple of years back, you know, and he was like, oh, well, you know, I know Mark came up with a phrase, but we made a concept stick. And I'm like, yeah, we did. Because until Last Angel, no one had really dared to, <laughs> to call it by its name. <laughs> you know, Afterwards, everyone was like, oh, yeah, of course. But before that, not really. You know, it was sort of a term in some scholarly journal that Mark Derry had written. And that was it. You know, it was like, and you know, it would have stayed in the academy had we not bursting through the library and liberated the book, <laughs> read it loud in the streets, you know, quite literally and metaphorically. That's, I think that's what happened. We, we sort of raided the academy, took it out and, and gave it flesh, you know, put body to it. This is what it could mean. Normally at this point I ask about other media, it's yeah. got to be film. Yes. And I'm aware, sort of sitting here, we've got this presentation that's from your Fact Liverpool show, which is of... The Black Audio Collective's entire filmic reference history, all your loves from the world of film, and there are about a hundred names or something. <laughs> so, rather than being in here all day, tell me who you're thinking about film wise now. <laughs> oh, thank you for sparing me <laughs> having to go through, you know. I never thought this would happen, but actually, this is exactly what's happened. Because when you watch all this stuff, you're thinking, oh, it might inform your practice. You know? 
what no one tells you is that you can't then forget it. <laughs> right? So it becomes increasingly difficult to do anything without these ghosts mm. hanging around. You know, the, literally the minute you set a camera down in a lens-based project, there's Solanus or Tarkovsky or Bresson. Oh, actually, you know, I'll put it there instead. You, you know, so you come to a point where you have to start fighting with them to leave you alone. <laughs> you know? And it's a great thing to have, but it is also true that the anxiety of influence takes a decidedly dark turn as you get older because there is a difficulty in trying to do anything about Cuba without thinking about memories of underdevelopment. There's something, it's difficult to think about an animal without thinking about Bresson's, Barthesar. You know, it's difficult to think about doing something on, I don't know, black working class life, especially in America. Charles Burnett, Kill Those Sheep. You know, so it's, it's very difficult to wander into a space without having what, vendors called the colonization of your unconscious by cinema. I mean, he meant American cinema, but actually it's not just American cinema. It's all cinema. And that's not a mystery because the psychic factory that was the cinema has occupied a very, very large part of our brains, all of ours. So it's conventions, it's ways of imagining the world, narrativizing it. I mean, I smoked for decades i don't anymore but I, and when i did every time i took a puff i just had a figure from the cinema in my head you know it's just like one of those things that's happened really so actually the trick now is to remember and forget <laughs> because the autonomy required to forget is central to our practice otherwise we can't work well we can't say anything of note that hasn't already been done and when people speak about the archive in the work, I think it's important to realize that we're also talking about that. It's the unseen archival presence of that history in the practice, you know, because we knew it inside out, you know. It was, it was a passion. But even that was archival, you know, because we knew that every new wave that had come before us especially the French one, <laughs> did exactly that. Immersed itself in the history of cinema to come up with a, a way of doing things. You know, so even that itself, that gesture, is itself an archival one, as an inheritance from the cinema. I always find it much more useful when people ask me, like, what do you think about this film? And then suddenly, boof, right. Because there's so many. There are so many that, you know, I was rearranging part of my DVD library and you know it's like you look at it so Godard just died and so I just wanted to figure out what I didn't have and actually the problem wasn't what I didn't have is what I didn't have in what format <laughs> you know because <laughs> there's stuff that I recorded on video from TV so I have Godard's History of the Cinema on VHS and then I bought a laser disc of Le Chinois in Japan in, I don't know, 94 or something. And then I've got DVDs <laughs> of Le Mepris and uh, Abu Soufflé and, and then Blu-rays <laughs> of the same films. You know, so a lot, <laughs> a lot. That was a very good way of answering. That's excellent. Um, if you could live with one work of art, what would it be? Mantegna's Dead Christ, I think. I've never seen it. I mean, in the flesh, as it were. Um, I've only ever seen it in reproduction. But there's something about its staging of the scene of mortality that I've never forgotten. And I think, in a way, it's probably the most remarkable staging in the history of European painting that I know of. Not technically accomplished at all, and it's kind of weirdly stuck between the world we're about to go in with the quattrocentral perspective, etc., and the older, more flat world. You know, it's actually quite flat in places. It's more medieval than Renaissance, but the power of it, I mean, just the sheer weight of the scene of mourning that it presents 
and the honesty, the absolute veracity with which it attempts to stage the death of Christ as a kind of incident of mortality. I don't know any better. So yeah, probably that. <laughs> and lastly, what's art for? You know, it's one of those questions that used to be easier to answer than it is now. Only because I think there were debates about it that were sustaining. Now I'm not sure that it has to be for but I know what it has to be. And it's a, a bit like the Polish writer, you know, Richard Kapuczynski, said that what he did was rummage through the forest of things, you know. And he used a very fancy Latin phrase, which <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass myself trying to say. <laughs> that, but, but it amounts to the same thing. And, and I, I think that sense of a wander through a forest of things is one that art needs to stage more often for people because actually the sense of an impasse, the sense that we're at crossroads, junctions where all manner of options are available is very present in all our lives, you know. And I don't think that the role of art is to be there necessarily telling people which of the roads to take because all will be useful, but we do have to move you know, along some of them. But I do think that it has a role to point out what those junctions are. It has a role to tell people that where the forests are and to alert people to the fact that there are things in the forest to be found and discovered. Those are functions that I would very happily embrace, you know. Anything else risks the um, possibility of disappointment. <laughs> Anything else risks the possibility of failure. I know, I've lived through a few. <laughs> John, thank you very much. No problem, a real pleasure. Thank you for coming. John Aconfra, Purple is at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. from the 28th of October until the summer of 2023. The Unfinished Conversation is at Tate Britain in its collection displays, the walk through British art, until at least the end of 2022. And the new work that John mentioned in our conversation, Exploring Viruses in the Context of Colonialism in the Americas, will be shown first at the Sharjah Biennial between the 7th of February and the 11th of June 2023, before travelling to The Box in Plymouth in the UK. UK, where it opens in December next year. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Please also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the Art Newspaper podcasts are Amy Dawson and Henrietta Bentel. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A big thank you to John Aconfra. That's all for this series. We'll be back in November. See you then. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.